I've been doing uh, feminist theoretical research and, uh, uh, and activism for over 15 years now. And um, during the time this um, research became integral part, an integral part of my art practice. So yeah, it is a pleasure for me to be here, uh, but not only as, an, uh, as a co-organizer, uh, I will also um, be a speaker today uh, to talk about my uh, project, Stories of Migrant Women, um, which has been run between 2017 and 18. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm a co-organizer co with um, FemLens, uh, because, you know, uh, it is a great partnership for, from my point of view. They are uh, a great organization and um, because, uh, because of the same vision we have, uh, we also share um, some of the object, uh, objectives, um, which are uh, mainly um, related to empower women. Uh, using cultural uh, tools, uh, giving the, um, the chance to, you know, also represent themselves instead of being represented. Um, this is a quite political event. We will put together people from different areas of the, uh, and levels of the creative and cultural industry. So I'm pretty sure we will have a great outcome from this. So I'll just take over um, one more time. So just to say that we're really excited for everybody who's coming in. Please say hello um, in the chat and tell us where you're coming from. As I was saying that I think we're from five continents. It's really amazing opportunity to, to to bring everybody together. And I think that this is how the internet should work. We should still be making new connections and new partnerships. I think we're starting to sort of take for granted the opportunity the internet gives us. And so we hope that with this event, we can re-remember what, what we were so excited about the internet maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So just some housekeeping quickly to let you know that uh, we are recording uh, all the talks so that in, we can share um, all the panels and discussions that we'll be having. And so if anybody is not okay of having their faces, uh, you can turn off your camera, but if you're okay with being recorded, please uh, feel free to put your camera on. It's really nice to see everybody, um, just because I think it's nice to know who's who. Um, and then I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Oh, yeah, there's one more thing. Uh, if you would like uh, to tweet or, or Instagram or whatever about what's happening, we've made some hashtags. I'm just going to copy them into the chat. Don't have to, but um, if you feel like, why not? And then, so I'm going to tell you about the program today specifically, because I know that in the program, we sort of just said day one uh, as a single block. The program is a little bit experimental. We're going to have a photo presentation of two workshop participants from FemLens. Uh, they took part in our workshops in Shatila refugee camp in Beirut and Lebanon in 2017. And since then, we have been working with them on various, uh, on various projects. And um, so they're showing us stories of their lives and the life of the camp from inside the, from an inside perspective, or as I call it, lived experience, uh, live, lived experience experts or voices. After the presentation, which will run twice, it's about 13 minutes long and I'll run it uh, twice so that everybody can get to see the photos and read the text. Um, I would like, this is experimental. We'll see if this works out or not. And if you feel good with this, um, I can put everybody out into break up, breakout rooms and like groups of three or five, depending. And it would be super nice if you maybe had a small discussion about what you saw for about 10 minutes. And then after that, we will have two speakers uh, who are representing the European Network of Migrant Women and another speaker from the Arab Women Solidarity Association in, based in Belgium. And they will talk about the importance of voices coming from within the community and why storytelling matters by lived experience experts, as I call them, um, and what it means to, to media and photography and our understanding of different situations. Um, and then later on, there will be a presentation by Oki Ardia, a photographer from Indonesia, and Alicia, who will then show their own projects of migration-related topics, and they will talk about 
their experiences working photographers and why they choose stories of migration. And then at the end, we hope to have a little discussion between, um, we have three Alice's with us tonight um, and Oki, who will then discuss the, the importance of both professional photography, professional sto storytelling, the different perspectives that that brings to us and voices from within communities. So this is day one. It's, um, yeah, as I said, I think a little bit experimental, but uh, we really hope that, that you know, maybe we come to some new vision or understanding or, yeah. So meanwhile, please feel free to, if you're listening to somebody and you want to say something, you can either raise your hand and add a comment uh, speaking, or you can always ask questions in the chat. It will be open and, you know, then we'll be reading them out and um, happy to, um, to discuss anything, any questions that come up. Yes, it is okay.
So well done. I have to tell you, good good work. I enjoy um, a lot of stuff about this uh, uh, presentation. Cool. Um, as I was talking with other woman about the the um, importance of words in together or the story, like you know, like a diary, like mm -hmm. a, Alisa and Alicia. Oh, um, so they will be representing the let's say not the point of view obviously of the the workshop participants we would have loved to have them with us but they don't speak english and translation with a bad internet is just yeah not, not something that really works very well but i hope that because the, they will talk a little bit about their backgrounds and why we invited them in particular to speak about this so uh, they will do a just yeah talk about themselves their background and why why this community voices matter so alicia and alice alisa <laughs> please welcome introduce yourself thank you uh so thank you for the invitation i'm really glad i was really moved by what we saw before together so I'm Alisa and I represent the European Network of Migrant Women, which is an NGO that works uh, towards uh, achieving freedom, dignity and rights for migrant women in Europe. So we do advocacy, research and projects. And also um, I'm the spokeswoman of a French feminist organization, Oser le Féminisme, which means uh, Dare to be Feminist. And I created an artistic company that uses art and pedagogy to speak about equality between uh, boys and girls uh, with children and young adults. Uh, so we, we use a video, photography, a lot of theater, um, painting, uh, and that kind of thing, uh, writing as well. And that's actually something that uh, touched me a lot with this uh, presentation was uh, that in addition to the picture, there were these written words that I thought uh, were bringing a lot to the table. And as I was saying uh, during the breakout room, um, it took me on a journey and I really loved it. Um, I think that it's a very new perspective and that's what's interesting uh, in this idea of uh, self-representation, I guess. Um, something about hearing new voices. That's something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, in feminism, it's something really important because women voices uh, are not heard as we know uh, in society, either through culture or politic um, or history or anything really for that matter. So this idea of hearing new point of view stories told in another way from another perspective. I really like that. And I think 
that it takes us away from the usual representations. Uh, for instance, the very first series of picture, it was about finding these flowers, uh, finding the green, the light, the hope uh, in the camps. I think that's not something that's usually portrayed uh, because we always have a point of view from the outside and we end up with having always the same pictures and the same representations of these camps. And I think there was something really new in having all of these colors and this nature and this idea of care and love and hope. And I also think in, it showed in the representation of the people, especially the women, because it was sensitive. It was, uh, there was this idea of they don't want their faces to be photographed. So I'm going to take uh, photograph the, the colors, the clothes, that kind of thing, the scarves. So that was also interesting. That's something that I haven't uh, seen before. Um, yeah, I, I was also saying in the breakout room that I think to me it would have transported me even more without the music because I think the story in itself was uh, very strong. And yeah, I think the main idea that I got from it is that finally the, the, the people in the camp, the women, they were the subjects or something and not just objects being uh, photographed and yeah being pa passive, passive. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, thank you for, <laughs> for showing us this. I'm gonna let uh, Alicia speak. Thank you. Hello everyone again, and thank you again for the chance to address you today. So I'm Alicia Arvid, uh, coordinating Arab Women Solidarity Association Belgium. As a feminist organization, we promote women's rights in Arab countries and we work to help women living abroad and especially here in Brussels and here in Brussels to realize their rights, covering various issues from equality, migration challenges, sexual reproductive rights. Our goal is to build bridges between different cultures and to empower women to break cliche on Arab cultures and on Arab women too and to improve the image of Arab women. And I'm very happy to be here tonight because it makes sense at a professional uh, level, but also at a personal level, as I'm coming from South Lebanon. Um, uh, so yes, my understanding of this importance of this work and of this photo is also very personal and I'm very uh, touched by what I saw, uh, even if uh, 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 I just talked with in the private room some other woman who did know about Libya. For me, it's familiar because I know about Beirut, I know about uh, uh, this kind of streets. But uh, yeah, so thanks for uh, bringing me here tonight. Uh, I think the storytelling helps to promote knowledge and critics uh, through the pictures and it helps to analyze the experience that people and that um, uh, uh, Fatin and Halima had about their own stories, about their own communities. It's from the inside, as Alisa said, and it's a way when we can visit countries, cultures, and we can know more about the news uh, through the eyes of this woman. And especially we can feel their emotions thanks to the pictures, but also thanks to the, the stories they tell, the, the text they add on the pictures. So for me, it was kind of, a, as much as documentary photography, it has the power to create a change in society and to have a great impact on mentalities. It's like we had the feeling of being there just by seeing the presentation and we were in a gallery, so could you imagine? <laughs> the, so, and uh, another thing uh, why it's important uh, to have storytelling from the inside is that the roles of participants and professionals or researchers are redefined. We have this new methodology where the knowledge is not only in the hands of professionals, uh, um, it's like this famous uh, 
thing we say we do not speak with uh, uh, we do not speak about Palestinian women we speak with them uh, through this work uh, and I think it is very important um, and for me uh, I saw some similar similarities between feminism and this storytelling because um, as much as feminism the participants are at the center we reverse the tendency they are the subject and not the object anymore like Alisa said and also has feminism it's allowed the voices to speak uh, there is an empowerment um, and uh, finally there is this authenticity where messages are based on personal experiences uh, we can feel that uh, uh, Fatin uh, uh, um, when she say about the flowers of Shatila, she, 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 she was so disappointed because she couldn't find a rose. And we can feel uh, all this disappointment in, in they are expressing the photos. And I, I'm not sure if a, a professional photographer would, would share the same uh, emotions. Mm. Uh, and we can see that it's coming really from her personal experiences. As much as Halima, when she, she fear being in the alleys, when she expressed the stress, it's, it's like uh, we can see that she's kind of suffocated and, and she's still cramped and unsafe in this place. And again, it's not the same if we were just arrived in this alley and took picture. It's not the same as living there and, and, and talking about your own personal experience. And I think that's why there is some similarities with feminism and storytelling also. Um, um, another point that uh, um, I wanted to share, it's uh, for me, this work helped to break cliche on Arab women and especially on Palestinian women. Um, even, if we, even if you don't know about uh, Lebanon or, 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 um, or the situation there, we know about Palestine, we know about what the media told us and Mostly when we saw Palestinian women, it's, it's as a position of uh, victim uh, with uh, not so many colors. And, and so I think this work is very interesting because um, it includes Palestinian women and, and we need to include them in the discussion at any uh, level, national, international level. And, and so... This is very important to break cliche on, 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 uh, on this um, part of the world, especially now. Um, so, um, and this is something that we try to do with Arab Women Solidarity Association. We, we try to uh, break cliche on Arab women and to bring them, uh, to include them uh, at the center. We do, for example, uh, some exhibitions. We create exhibition with and by women. Uh, we had some at a local level, uh, but we also had some uh, uh, cultural projects when we invite artists, women artists, uh, Arab women artists to promote them. We do some toolkits. For example, we have one on Arab uh, women professional photographers. Uh, it's on our website, but I can send you the link on the chat if you want, if you're interested. We, we kind of um, do this project to, again, reverse the tendency and bring uh, Arab women uh, here in Brussels to share uh, messages and, and to share their own experience and, and as experts. At, and I think it's important to do this and the other side, the South contributing to the North and not just only the way we are used to look like the North is contributing. And, and so, yeah, so it breaks the cliche. And also, of course, as a feminist, uh, I think it's also very relevant and um, important because it promotes women's photographers. And I think it's important to inspire girls and other women uh, for me, we, we have the same uh, goal as Femme Lens because I think it's really important to no normalize this vision as, um, and to, to, to say to, to young women and to girls that uh, photography is also for them. Photography has to become more natural for girls and women. I think role models are so important today 
uh, and this uh, work showing uh, two, two young Palestinian women uh, taking pictures of their community, uh, sharing, writing. Uh, it's, it is so inspiring for uh, a lot of women from all around the world, but especially also for young women. And uh, finally, I would say this work is really important because it leaves a mark. It gives freedom to individuals through the camera also. It's like another tool to uh, express yourself. Uh, it's, it's so, uh, it's a pity that the, uh, Halima and Fatin are not here to, to share with us. Uh, and I think uh, it's also, um, but they, they stay. They, they, they give. They, they give. They share today thanks to their work because the the camera helps them also to to to. It's another language, you know, and that, uh, and I think by working with uh, Arab women as as uh, having a Arab uh, background, it's not so easy all the time to express yourself, especially as a woman. Um, so uh, I think the camera. And the storytelling help you to go beyond the prohibitions to the taboos the, and the bricks that sometimes you put on yourself or sometimes the community can put on your on on, on us so it is also a very uh, effective and important tool to keep going on to use and to to invite other uh, uh, young women or women to use to express themselves it's another way to express also so it's uh, still empowerment. Um, that's uh, yeah. And about the, uh, I couldn't miss it about the scarce portraits. I love it so much. It's also a good way to to again to speak uh, to let them speak by themselves and to speak with Arab women, with Palestinian women, and, and not to speak about Palestinian women only. Uh, and I think scarce portrait work, it's so important, especially here in the context of uh, Brussels and France, when we have all this debate and, and when we face racism and sexism uh, with migration issues. And, and so this kind of work, again, is breaking cliche, but it's also um, saying who is allowed to look and to capture something. Uh, uh, they, 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 um, they really uh, take the space, they, they, they really uh, share their presence. And even if we don't see their faces, they, they share a lot uh, through this uh, scale uh, poetry project. And, uh, and I think, uh, and we have this uh, project with the Arab Women Solidarity Association. Right now we are working on uh, clothes and um, the, the the, the social codes and the, the identity issues uh, connected to clothes and to uh, fashion. And, and we wanted to have a special focus on Arab uh, perspective. So to, to talk, for example, about the Mindil and the, and the Kaftan and all of these uh, uh, clothes and the scars of also uh, all of these clothes uh, and the meanings, the, the symbols that we have connected with a, a feminist uh, point of view, because it's part of the story. Today, we, we see the scars in this way, but it wasn't at the same day, uh, the day after, and we won't be the, the same. So it's, it's also, again, having a, um, a historical, historical uh, 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 work. Like uh, it's not just telling stories; it's also taking part in history by telling what is happening in their own communities and and how they do in their own communities. So yeah, that's a really brilliant work. And again, thanks for uh, uh, sharing it today. That was a, that was a question. Uh, do you think such stories need to be discussed, not only seen? Do people from outside the situation can understand the story without the words? And I think it's very interesting, a very interesting question because to me the answer is no, not really. I, I thought the words were really complementing the, the pictures, the images, and that was giving a voice to it and I like the use of the first person because 
now we can see that there are feelings and thoughts behind the pictures. And usually we see this image, like the image of an alley, and we might have our own emotions, like, I don't know, it um, seems mysterious, it seems uh, interesting, it seems so many things. And now we know it's actually scary for the person taking the picture at this very moment. I think it brings a completely new perspective to to the image and yeah i really liked uh how the complement the complementary thing between the pictures and the text don't know what you you think alicia if you want to answer as well i think uh yes it's a really uh it's a good start to have the 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 photos and the text but I think to have an impact even more and to create change, to have the power to create change, it's important to share more about the environment because the texts are telling about their emotions, but not necessarily on the political situation and how, how come there are these wires in the alleys? Why the, the situation in, in, in Shatila is like that? So this is why I think, but maybe we are going to talk about it later. This is why I think it's important to, to make connections between um, participants uh, and researchers and to work hand by hand uh, as much as saying that we need to, to, to let the camera uh, from the inside of the community, but we keep going on with uh, 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 working with professional photographers or, and researchers. And, and yes, it could be also important to have, um, I don't know, uh, maybe a conference on, on, uh, on Chatila situation, uh, history uh, um, explanation and, and so, Yes, it, it, it can be mo even more powerful by working hands by hand. And again, there is similarity with feminism because uh, feminism, uh, they, they have impact also by working uh, um, hands by hands in uh, the advocacy and the local level and, and, and Yes, how we can all of this together uh, to have a, to create the change actually um, in the mentalities, but also uh, in a social way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that art is really powerful because it creates emotion, and emotion can be at the static starting point of change because it leads to thinking. It leads to changing your mind. It opens a lot of doors. Um, I've noticed when I started working with Ozelo Feminism that when I was animating, facilitating debates or conferences, it was really not the same uh, pedagogy, the same methods and the same dynamics uh, than when I was facilitating an exchange after a play or anything artistic, a movie or something like that, because people had felt something and they were way more open to discussing, analyzing, um, and actually reflecting on this emotion. So I think it's a really good way um, to create change than to create bridges between arts and research and advocacy and politics and all of these uh, different sectors. And there were two other questions, but I think there are more for you, Kate. Uh, it's about the editing and also the, tra the, the translation. Maybe you want to, to answer. <laughs> I was muted. Um, <laughs> the first one, details about editing, who, how edited the photos. So part of the workshop, is we learned because we work with mobile phones only well mo most of the time because most of our students can't afford or don't own a camera so we work with the mobile phones and part of the workshops is we learn how to how to use editing softwares or applications so we use snapseed um, or even instagram or whatever is available if the question is more about the editing rather as a sequence and how it is presented 
obviously this this is a process that we do on our side depending if we have an exhibition or a publication or a presentation like this or something um, however for example the the last bit about the explosion this Halima and I we worked on together she sent different photographs we talked about which photographs were better which ones were not it was actually really cool so now it's been like three years that we're working on and off together and uh, she was already sending some photographs that she had recognized that were really good they were already edited because I asked her I said did you edit this photo in terms of the look yeah the colors and stuff and she had already recognized which was a good photo and which wasn't and then she went and did the edits herself in terms of light and color so I thought that was really cool that was uh, quite fulfilling but um, for the actual yeah sequencing and structuring and stuff on the most part, we do that ourselves. Also, uh, Halima and Fatan have entered a number of photo competitions and in one Halima actually won in that photo competition. And obviously we helped with the selection of the photographs. And this is kind of part of the work of FemLens is to always be available for our ex-students or you know, I don't consider them ex-students, I consider them to be part of the community. We have a Facebook group where we also try to share some learning materials to continue developing. So it's kind of, it's a mutual process. Uh, this is for editing. I hope that answers your question, Kulchin. Um, in terms of translation, uh, so part of the workshops is also uh, very, very brief because there's so much. So our workshops are generally like 16 hours spread over four personal, uh, like in person meetings. But then, as I said, we continue um, talking online. I feel like the the conversations online, they are part of the education of actually getting to know how to use technology because a lot of uh, women from the backgrounds that we work with, they would generally have a very basic understanding of like Facebook and Gmail. And that's it, that's kind of the limitations of their technology use. And I think that a lot of these tech companies, they pride themselves on technology use, but you know, we kind of get into the situation where we have to use translators and then we start using chat apps and you know instagram and we're sort of expanding their knowledge so they usually send us a text in their own language or sometimes they use google translate or whatever is available but so part of the workshops is the the writing module let's say and um, also a diary piece that they can then choose to share or not to share. So they document the, the feelings that they have when they're taking photographs, when they're meeting people and how, uh, how they feel about all of that. And then, so depending on the language, we usually find somebody who speaks um, the language that the text is in and we get that translated. It was actually very, Interesting that some uh, that you ask about this because the very first time that we had the text translated about, I think it's about the valley, the alleys, where Halima mentions uh, the drugs and the the weapons. I think it's in here, or maybe it's not in here, but it's in one of the publications. But um, the person who translated it for for us, they censored it. So I realized much later when I put it into Google Translate, just to say, it's, I don't know, it's like didn't occur to me that this person would censor this part of the text. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's really interesting. So yeah, I think the very first time that we might've published on Instagram or somewhere, um, it came out not a hundred percent. So yeah, now we definitely double check with Google Translate and then we give it to somebody who speaks um, both languages well in order to have a better structure for the language because Google Translate is also not necessarily always accurate and it also relies very much that the person who's writing is extremely literate. I have found this a number of times that if the language is not you know, 100% correct in terms of spelling or structure, it doesn't, like it translates, it tra translates into gibberish. It, like you don't understand what, what the person was trying to say. So that was also an interesting thing that I noticed that I never realized before. So this was something that I then learned about some of the workshop participants is that maybe, you know, they're not 100% literate. And that's so interesting because we don't ask these questions. We just say, you know, let's learn something together and it's verbal and, we have results so yeah that's the translation um, 
process. So I was just speaking to mm -hmm. Aki and she was saying it. that in one hour um, she will not have electricity because she's on an island and they switch off electricity there at night. Oh my God. So we have very little time. <laughs> Take your time, no worries. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> That's crazy. But anyway, it's already 1 a.m. I understand that it's... Um, this idea that we can bridge all continents is, um, it's a working in progress. Sometimes it doesn't work here. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe not fully bridge all continents. <laughs> we try. Okay, so. I think it's actually Oki's turn now. Yeah. It will be Oki now. Is it? Is it my turn? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, um, hi everyone. Oh, uh, thank you. First thing first, thank you to Femlands and Viga uh, for inviting me and everyone here for uh, staying with us. So, good morning here from Indonesia. Uh, I'm Oki. Um, basically, uh, I'm, I'm a freelance documentary photographer. Previously, I'm working as a writing journalist. So uh, I'm based in Jakarta, the capital city, uh, but uh, for the last uh, two months, um, uh, I'm staying in East Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia, as we, I think we have uh, participants from Netherlands because we have a very close uh, relationship with Netherlands because Indonesia uh, had been colon, sorry, because Indonesia had been colonialized by the Dutch for more than 300 years. So um, yeah, I think that's a, just a short story about Indonesia and also Indonesia. I think Indonesia is very famous about uh, Bali, but Bali is part of Indonesia and Indonesia is uh, the biggest archipelago and we have more than a thousand islands and also we have 33 provinces. But that's about Indonesia, I think. Um, okay, I think, um, shall I share my presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, wait, let me see. Does it work? Yeah, I see it. Oh. It looks properly. Okay, so um, when home is no longer home is my personal project. Uh, it's my personal project uh, that I've been doing for the last uh, seven years, uh, on and off, uh, on and off because it's a personal uh, project. Um, so sometimes I have to uh, finance for the project itself or apply for a grant or sometimes I have to uh, waiting until I have, a, um, until I have a more money to finance for the project. So um, uh, basically, this is Indonesia. This is Indonesia. Uh, and I'm, this is the Jakarta, the capital city. I'm currently staying here in East Nusa Tenggara. It's a very small island, a remote island as well. And um, so uh, it started uh, the first time I started the project, uh, when I was working as a, as a writing journalist, um, I read a lot of stories about uh, Indonesian migrant workers. This is story of Nirmala Bonat. Nirmala Bonat, uh, this photo was taken in 2004 while I was reporting about a uh, human rights issue. So, uh, it was 2004, I was working as a, as a reporter, and so I interviewed uh, the family and in Malabona, she was, uh, she was working as a um, migrant workers in Malaysia. This is uh, on the yellow color is Malaysia, our neighbor country, and Indonesia is very famous as a, one of the biggest supply country for migrant workers uh, to Malaysia, to Middle East, uh, and also to Hong Kong and uh, mostly uh, neighbor country, uh, mostly in Malaysia. So Nimala Bonat uh, from East Nusa Tenggara and she was abused, uh, ironed and uh, had a physical 
uh, abuse from the employer, from her employer. So, uh, and then uh, 10 years after I resigned um, my job uh, as a reporter, I studied as a freelance documentary photographer. Uh, I, I kept reading the same story about uh, Indonesian migrant workers being abused or sometimes they receive a sexual harassment from the employer or sometimes they got uh, traffic or another um, a side, side of abuse. Sometimes they just um, being victim of human, uh, being victim of the human trafficking as a migrant workers. So, uh, and then um, it triggered me to find more about what happened about uh, what happened with my country, what happened with uh, migrant workers? Because I read uh, the story issue about uh, human uh, condition or sometimes human trafficking and migrant workers uh, way back more uh, when I was working as a reporter in 2004, but it still happened until now. So, and then I started uh, taking photos and research about um, but uh, Indonesian migrant workers. So uh, Malaysia is one of the biggest um, destination country uh, for Indonesian migrant workers because, uh, as you can see on the map, yeah, it's a neighbor neighbor country. It's very easy to cross uh, at the country, both legally or illegally. So I studied my project in um, I studied the project in Malaysia. When I studied this is Malaysia. So I studied in Malaysia because uh, Malaysia has the highest issue about um, human trafficking and uh, issue about Indonesian migrant workers. So I went to Malaysia and then uh, I this is this is the photos of uh, they were in the ferry in the island like this one. This is the border because they can cross easily. Mostly as mostly are women uh, and mostly they are undocumented because it's very easy to cross the borders between Indonesia and Malaysia without passport, and uh, that it, that's very difficult because um, I mean like the, the, you can bribe uh, the, the officer, the police officer from the immigration. So mostly, mostly these uh, Indonesian migrant workers they cross easily from the ferry. Or by the, by the boat, um, or by uh, or they rarely use. Um, I mean, like it's very easy because you just you just bribe the officers and then you can cross easily between Indonesia and Malaysia. So I follow them, and they have the photos. And then this is the environment. Sometimes they uh, smuggled on the bus or on the truck, and this is the environment um, of Malaysia and Indonesia uh, along the borders area. So, um, I mean, like, it's very, it's very uneasy for me when I started the project because uh, sometimes you have to apply a visa as a journalist, and then uh, at that moment, um, mostly they are very. I mean, like, it takes like um, two months to get to a mapping. Uh, of the area and then also uh, approach approach them to tell the story and then uh, I interview and talk with them. So I was thinking of the challenge of being a photographer, I mean, um, it's not, how do I say, um, you're, you're not there when uh, the case happened. This is the story of Ira. Ira initially, Ira working uh, legally as migrant workers in Malaysia, but uh, she was being uh, sexually, she got sexually uh, abused and harassment by her employer, and then she ran away, but the employer kept the passport and all the contract and all, all the identity, um, passport, identity, contract, and everything. So when uh, she ran away, she became illegal. She was trying to uh, she didn't know how to go. She didn't know uh, how to get help because, um, I mean, like um, most of Indonesian migrant workers, when they working uh, in Malaysia, mostly they are undocumented and they are come they come from a very uh, poor island or very remote area in Indonesia with the poor condition on the village. So um, I'm not saying like. Uh, 
they they don't know how they don't know how to contact the, the person uh, in the embassy they don't know uh, they even don't know there's there's indonesian embassy in malaysia so it's very challenging it's also a problem when um, most of our women in women migrant workers working uh, abroad so initially on on the history indonesia has a lot of uh, long history on the migration when Indonesia being colonized by the Dutch. Uh, mostly, uh, we sent Indonesia sent um, men uh, working uh, in contract as, uh, in the field plant plantation. But after Indonesia's independence, we kept sending um, migrant workers. But now the the, situ the situation changed because mostly we're sending women. So it becomes a problem and more challenging when women become the main breadwinners because uh, they it's more risky. It's not only about uh, the risk of being sexually abused or sometimes they have to leave, the, uh, to leave their family behind. And also there's a lot of issues uh, when women migrant workers working abroad compared to men. Also, it's not saying that uh, men not saying that uh, men are less risky, but I think uh, women migrant workers is more risky because uh, there's a lot of issues related to the um, women migrant workers as well. So uh, when she ran away and then uh, I interview and then I, I guess the challenge is how to get, I mean, we as a professional photographer or sometimes as a visual storyteller, um, the challenge is not how we can represent the real situation, but uh, at that moment we were not there. So I was thinking about uh, to get uh, to make a diptych on comparison about uh, era, era, and also the going back to the place when where she got uh, where she received like a sexually arrest uh, harassment by the employer. And also, and I met another. I met from one from one uh, from one woman. I met another woman, and then like they have like a actually they have like a community or group. So it's very once you get once you get um, I mean like once you get their trust, they become very open to you. Uh, so that's why uh, during my personal project, I back and forth to Indonesia and Malaysia, and then I uh, keep uh, I maintain my conversation with them. So uh, they started to introduce me, and they taking me to uh, the local community or local group for Indonesian migrant workers in Malaysia. So after Ira, I met another uh, woman. Uh, uh, this is Kalina. Kalina working. Kalina have been working uh, undocumented and illegally in Malaysia. Uh, same story. Same story with Ira. Uh, previously, she worked uh, uh, legally in Malaysia, but uh, again, uh, there's a lot of um, based on the research. There's a lot of issue about uh, migrant Indonesian women, migrant workers in Malaysia being sexually abused uh, or sexually or they get. Uh, uh, sexual harassment by the employers. Yes, she ran away. They ran away uh, without passport and identity. They didn't know how to go. Uh, again, they didn't know. They didn't know uh, whom to contact. There's no women organization at that moment. So um, when she ran away and then she worked uh, illegally uh, in in the bar because that's the easiest. The, the easiest job for them because they can work in the company and then they can work in the factory with an identity and password and then no money to going back to Indonesia. So um, she, she was raped uh, in, in the bar uh, by uh, one police officer and also one uh, and also with the local men uh, with the Malaysian men but uh, again uh, with her status uh, as, illegal, as illegal migrant workers, uh, it's very, I mean, like, it's very difficult for her to go to the police officers because once uh, you report that you're being raped or uh, or being like, uh, or you get a sexual harassment, uh, when they, when she, when she, she was afraid to go to the police officer because uh, they will know that, oh, so you're undocumented, so you're illegal. Uh, 
and then uh, she was she was afraid that she will be sent home, and that way you cannot uh, you cannot um, you cannot find a job, and then you cannot send money uh, to her family. So this is just one case aside of Ira. So I interviewed Ira Kalina, and then I traced back, went back to the place uh, or to the place or um, to the area when uh, she was. Uh, she was raped or she got sexually harassed by the police officer or Malaysian Malaysian uh, or the local men uh, in, in Malaysia. This is also this is another story of a woman when I met in Malaysia, uh, also Indonesian migrant workers, also undocumented, also un undocumented. No, they she uh, her her name is is very similar. Her name is Juaria. Um, it's a little bit sad for me when I took this photo and then uh, when I editing and sequence the photo because um, five months after I took this photo, she was net uh, and then uh, she was sent to she was sent to jail uh, and then she departed to Indonesia. Um, when I discussed this uh, to uh, Indonesian embassy, that supposedly, supposedly, when uh, you when you are undocumented or you are illegally, when you are illegal or undocumented, um, I don't know. I mean, like uh, there's a rules that you cannot send, you cannot send them to a penitentiary or prison. Uh, when I discuss with the Indonesian embassy, I mean, there's a rules that uh, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but actually, when you, uh, when uh, before they departed to Indonesia, actually they they supposed to be like a, like a detention center, not to be sent to a prison. But uh, what happened in Malaysia? Usually, when you are undocumented or illegal, you directly sent to a prison, not to the detention center. So I mean, like this is one of the most uh, uh, one of the one of the most uh, big issues between the relationship between Malaysian government and Indonesia until now, because um, Indonesia and Malaysia is just like a love and hate relationship. I mean, like Malaysia need um, Indonesian migrant workers, uh, but at some point, um, the, the, we don't have like a strict regulation how to, about the regulation related to migrant workers between Indonesia and Malaysia. So this is the area when she when she was net and then sent to prison, and then uh, she departed to Indonesia. So after I took these photos, uh, previously I had a good communication with her, but after she did, well, after she departed to Indonesia and uh, after she was sent to prison, uh, I lost contact. So uh, no, I didn't know what happened to her. Probably I don't know whether. She was stayed in the village, or uh, or she decided to go back to Malaysia because this is also happened. It's very often to Indonesian migrant workers after you got deported. Sometimes you just uh, you seeing like you can falsify your identity and then you're going back to Malaysia. So this is also um, like a it's very common in Indonesia. I mean like sometimes like uh, you got deported like a three or five times uh, you just falsify and uh, falsify your identity and then you bribe uh, the police officers in immigration and then you can easily uh, cross to Malaysia and start working uh, as an illegal oh this is also a story about uh, Robia Robia also come from uh, West Java West Java is uh, the biggest, um, the is one of the biggest provinces in Indonesia, uh, known as a supplier, uh, supplier, supplier uh, city, Sukabumi from Sukabumi, West Java. So there's um, a lot of Indonesian migrant, Indonesian migrant workers. Um, uh, they are come from uh, West Java. So uh, Robi has come from West Java. When I took this. Um, she, she just came uh, in Malaysia. So just came in Malaysia, and then uh, I, 
as I mentioned before, I back and forth to Malaysia. So this is the first time I took photos in 2000, in 2015 when she came to Malaysia. And then I went back to Malaysia. Uh, this photo, I, I took this photo in 2017. So two years after I took the first photo, uh, she got also, uh, she got deported because um, actually um, she got a problem with the employer. She got a problem with the employer again. She got a problem with the employer again. The problem is like the employer usually they kept the passport and identity. So she ran away and then she started working. Uh, she started working in the factory. So she started working in the factory. Um, and the factory owner knows that uh, Robia is uh, undocumented. So it's very easy to like um, you can threat her easily like. If you if you're not working uh, like 12 hours, I can report you to the police officers, or sometimes, or sometimes when uh, uh, sometimes when um, the employer uh, had like a like a like an employee didn't want to pay like a, sometimes uh, they didn't pay the salary, to, uh, they didn't pay the salary. So it's very easy for them to threat uh, with her status as undocumented or illegal. It's very easy. Like uh, I can uh, I can pay you like uh, next month, or they they promise her to pay like uh, yeah I can pay you your salary next month and then but again and again again. So but usually um, they they never pay uh, they never give the salary to Robia. So uh, this is also another like another issue if you were working as a uh undocumented or illegally with a lot of risk uh being like uh you're you're not being paid or again like uh ira robia uh being raped or said got sexually harassment from the employer so this is so this is uh i think the photos this is the area when she decided to run away and jump to the net and then uh, she find uh, she find help to um, like an Indonesian community. So uh, this uh, community report this community report to Indonesian embassy that uh, uh, Robia with her status as undocumented, but she has been working like more than like uh, like more than like ten months without being paid at all. So uh, the case is still happening. Uh, uh, it's still it's still ongoing so they uh now they're still fighting how to get uh salary for uh, robia uh, this is story of uh this is a very like a sad story for me june uh, her name is june uh from java as well june started actually june working uh, is part of the june is a victim of human trafficking i think because um uh she, she came from east java and then uh from one of the poorest village in east java so uh, she she passed the family the family like uh, selling selling her to the broker and then uh they falsify her age so actually uh when she was uh, sent to malaysia she was 16 she was 16 and um but they falsify her age, uh, like a twenty years old. So uh, it's a very sad story because she was she was uh, she was working like almost with her with her age, uh, sixteen year, years old. She was uh, she, she was forced to work in a rich family, and she was working like more than like from more than like twelve hours. So she started working as a domestic worker from five p.m until midnight so it happens almost like uh, five years and then um and then after that i think um again there's a lot of issue um she she can't she couldn't stand anymore so she so she ran away so she ran away i mean that's a lot of story about uh indonesian migrant workers run away uh because uh probably they they Think that it was the easiest way to solve the problem. They never thought about when you run away uh, without identity and then uh, you become undocumented or you, or you become illegal. And then there's a lot of, uh, you're more, I mean, like uh, the more problems comes to you when you're undocumented uh, or illegal. And then um, once you decided to run away, 
uh, she was stopped. She kept working in Malaysia with her status of undocumented and illegal. So at one one night, when she just uh, when she was going uh, to the factory, and she like a shift shift night. I mean like uh, like a like she's working in in a shift. Uh, she was stopped by police officer, and the police officer as uh, oh the police officer check her identity as her identity and passport. She didn't have the, the passport. She didn't have any identity. So uh, so the police officer uh, asked her just give me some money, or and, and then they took the uh, they took her cell phone, and then asked for money around like fifty ringgit. Fifty ringgit actually fifty ringgit is less like less than $50 actually, but she didn't have the money. So one of the police officers said, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot give the money to us, you can give us your body. So, uh, so um, she, she, she decided to sleep with the, one of the police officers and then they release her. So uh, it's one of the story of Juwaria. Again, I mean, like uh, sometimes uh, with their status, um, it's like uh, they don't have any choice and they don't know what to do. Actually, although uh, in Mal I mean, like in Malaysia and Hong Kong, totally different. Malaysia, uh, they don't have like in Hong Kong, most Indonesian migrant workers they have a community and they have like organization. But in Malaysia, mostly they are working as domestic workers. So. Uh, it's very, uh, they're very limited to have like a small groups or they very, it's a very, they have like a very limited access how to, I mean, like how to join to, how to join the local organization or what to do uh, or, or even like how, what happened if there's something bad happened to me or uh, they even they even don't know where the Indonesian embassy it's also part of the problem uh, if I make a comparison between Indonesian migrant workers who works in Malaysia and Indonesian migrant workers who work in Hong Kong uh, there's very totally different culture and also there's a totally different like a regulation between each country and also uh, this is story of city city uh, also uh, undocumented I mean, um, the story of Siti, uh, Siti married with a local local man. Siti working in Malaysia, she, she married with a local man, and then uh, this uh, the man uh, decided to leave her. So she was pregnant. She was pregnant, and with her status, um, with her status, she, she she decided to leave to avoid the police officer or to avoid the immigration. Uh, she, uh, within one year, she has to live in a different uh, places. So uh, this is when I took this photo uh, because this is according to her. One night, uh, there's a I mean, like uh, the police officer in Malaysia or the immigration. Sometimes they have like uh, they already map. Oh, this is area for Indonesian migrant workers. This is area for the Bangladesh uh, workers, or this is area for like. Uh, for Indian, so uh, usually when um, one night, one night she heard that uh, the police officer or the immigration, or the immigration officer come to the Indonesian area, uh, checking, um, checking all uh, the, checking all the Indonesian uh, migrant workers whether they have a passport or whether they have an identity or contract that you work legally in Malaysia. So uh, she knows that uh, uh, she's undocumented and uh, illegal. So she decided to run. She decided to run and jump uh, the fence. Uh, but at the moment she was pregnant, so um, she was miscarried because uh, when she jumped, I mean the fence like almost had almost like two meters. I don't know how how did she get? Uh, he jumped on the fence. So um, this is like a, I'm trying to trace back. Uh, what happened to her and then uh, I, I went back to the place and then took the photos of the area. Okay, we have some yeah. questions and we have about okay. five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay, this is also the same story. This is Rania. 
uh, when I took these photos, uh, she was hospitalized because uh, she was she was called by the police officer uh, in Malaysia, and um, this is she was trying to jump on the fence uh, with her with her status of undocumented, and then I don't know what happened. Uh, she she went she got to jail uh, like a few months in Malaysia, and then when the Indonesian embassy uh, trying to help her. Um, uh, I mean, like she, she just like a, it's like she, she was very tra tra traumatized. And when I took these photos, uh, these photos I took this photo uh, in Jakarta actually in in Jakarta uh, because she was tra tra traumatized. And then she went to hospital. And then uh, the family and the social minister decided to send her to the uh, mentally hospital. And then. Um, I don't know. The, the, the last time, the last time I talked to her, she was told me that she told me about she was trying to uh, escape. She was trying to escape from her employer, and she was trying again to jump from the fence. And then the police officer, uh, the Malaysian police officer, got her, and then uh, sent her to uh, prison. And then uh, the Indonesian embassy trying to help her. Uh, when I trying to meet her in, in Indonesia, in Jakarta. She already in the mental hospital, and then, according to uh, hospital staff, uh, she was being traumatized. And then I only got one shot because they actually they didn't allow me to take me photos at that moment. So um, I'm with the family. I'm I'm trying to trying to uh, find the contact of the family because uh, when I decided to publish uh, the photos, uh, I need to inform them that I took the photos of her and then need to need to, uh, to get permission uh, from the family uh, just for the sake that, that the story is very important and uh, it's part of the my report it's part of the uh, it's part of the my uh, report of investigative uh, investigative uh, story about um, Indonesian migrant workers. So uh, this is just a quick uh, story. So after I took photos in Malaysia, um, I went back to the source uh, of the village. So mostly they come from West Java. West Java is the highest uh, province of supplier of Indonesian migrant workers. This is West Java. So mostly uh, when I went to their village, mostly um, also again, uh, the, the mostly like a, poor condition and also climate change is also one of the reason uh, that they decided to leave the village to find a better to find a better job so this is uh, when i went back from malaysia and then i traced back uh, the village uh, where they come from so i went to west java this is one of the condition one of the village uh, one of the village of the micro workers came from in west java uh, this is uh, when I met one of the Indonesian migrant workers when they decided to go to Malaysia and then they have to leave the family behind. Uh, I will follow one person and also most um, most of the most of the children in West Java uh, since the since the women are decided to uh, migrate they, they decided to working as a migrant worker so mostly they leave the children behind so uh, Sometimes I think about it's not only about um, uh, sending women sending women to working abroad, but also the social cost because they have to leave the family behind and also uh, they I mean like they usually they just leave their children to their family or to their parents. So this is I took the photos of the kids with other parents. And also this is a story of Robia. When they got deported, the same story for Malaysia, and then they got deported. So I follow and trace her. I went back to the village. Uh, this is the same story of Robia, uh, the previous one when I took photos in the car. So my last chapter is uh, East Nusa Tenggara. East Nusa Tenggara um, is a little bit. It's a little bit different with West Java because West Java is the, the biggest supplier uh, provinces in Indonesia for um, migrant labor for migrant workers. But East Nusa Tenggara, uh, East Nusa Tenggara is also one of the biggest um, one of the one of the one of the biggest 
village uh, provinces in Indonesia um, for the migrant workers working in Malaysia. But uh, compared to West Java, East Nusa Tenggara has the highest has the highest statistic for uh, human trafficking because um, mm -hmm. I'm currently in East Nusa Tenggara. This is the landscape. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's one of the poorest uh, provinces in, in Indonesia. So mostly uh, the, with the limited access uh, to water, with, uh, it's very dry and then limited access uh, to infrastructure. So uh, mostly uh, women uh, in East Nusa Tenggara, they are working as a like 80 percent uh, Indonesian migrant workers works in Malaysia. Uh, 80 percent are came from um, East Nusa Tenggara. So this is Marian Chikabu. Marian Chikabu is one of the victim of human trafficking. Uh, she she worked in Malaysia undocumented uh, because uh, I mean um, East Nusa Tenggara predominantly uh, it's a Catholic. So the modus, uh, the modus operandi from the brokers, sometimes they just uh, tell these women from the village in remote area in East Nusa Tenggara. So sometimes they use the modus operandi like, uh, I got the, I got like, a, I got the sixth sense. I hear uh, God's voice that you have to go, that you have to go to Malaysia because uh, East Nusa Tenggara, most of the most of the people here is they are very religious. They are really, uh, they are very religious and um, dominantly are Catholic, so they really trust God. So the brokers sometimes use a different modus operandi that I hear God's voice that you have to go. And uh, she went to Malaysia and she went uh, like, uh, she worked uh, sick for eight months. For the last eight months, she was uh, uh, not only sexually abused, but physically abused. And then uh, the employer only only fed, uh, fed her like uh, one one time per day, and then uh, she never get the salary. And then uh, I mean, like there's a lot of issue. I mean, it's very famous. In, uh, the issue is very famous in Indonesia because she's got sexually abused and everything else, and physical abuse. And uh, she was she was escaped. She was escaped uh, after she write on the letter and throw it to the window that help me, help me, help me, help me. My employee hit me. And then uh, one of the neighbor in the apartment got the letter and then read the letter and then reported to police. And then the police um, and then the police came and then checked her condition. And when she found out, I mean, like blood everywhere uh, on, on her body. So uh, I met her in East Nusa Tenggara. This is the family. So again, similar like um, what happened in West Java, most of the women, uh, they're working as migrant workers. So they leave the, the children left behind. So it's very, I mean, it's very common. We, when we come in the village in East Nusa, in East Nusa Tenggara, uh, we, we, we see a lot of children without their parents and a lot of children without their parents because the women, uh, the women are working abroad as migrant workers. And then the male usually they uh, migrate or they working uh, in, the, in the big city in East Nusa Tenggara on, or in a different provinces. So it's very common to see a lot of children in East Nusa Tenggara without their parents. This is just as uh, similar with this one. And I think, and, the last time, um, the project related to the project, uh, one of the one of the projects uh, was exhibited in Slovenia, Galeria Jakovic, uh, in March. So uh, I worked with the curators, and then we decided that it's not only uh, exhibiting the photos, but also we decided to make a postcard. We decided to make a postcard with the idea that. Uh, you can write down, um, so I, uh, I write down this, there's this story along with the postcards. So, um, so uh, all the participants or um, audience, they, uh, when they, or the visitors, when they visit the exhibition, they can read the story and then they can write down uh, about uh, the opinion or uh, express their uh, emotion or everything else on the postcard and then um, the postcard will be sent to me and then I will uh, give it back to the micro workers as well. So that's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Aki. So just quickly, two questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you do with these pictures? Is there an exhibition where they published in magazines or newspapers or posted on websites? And how did you get them to open up and tell you their stories? Oh, yeah. So uh, the, I think like um, one, one first thing first, I, when I uh, made the story, um, it's very... Uh, it's very challenging to get a uh, publication uh, to publish the story because um, newspaper usually only took like uh, only like a single photos and then uh, or sometimes they're not very interested to publish the story uh, with a lot of photos or sometimes uh, when I whenever I applied uh, for the publication they usually only need like one photos or two photos and then write in the story. I mean, like uh, one time I think it's okay, but uh, I, when I try to, it's published in a local newspaper, it's published in a local newspaper, but uh, I, but um, I keep, I keep, I don't know, I keep forcing and uh, applied uh, or sending a proposal that uh, this issue is very important. So it's not only, it's not, one photo so two photos is not enough i mean like uh, uh i mean I, I i do believe with the the power of visual uh and then not many people read a lot of uh, not, not not many people interesting to read a lot of text so that's why uh i mean the last time i published the story in a magazine in the in the magazine for for in the magazine like only like uh, two pages uh, and then the last time I pub uh, in the exhibition in Slovenia um, I think it's a uh, it's a great collaboration because it's not only exhibiting the photos but also uh, how to engage with the audience so far so I mostly published the story in the local newspaper and then um, exhibiting uh, in a Nepal, in Kathmandu, and mostly in the festival so far. Mm -hmm. Great. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I think so. So you, you have all mediums, exhibitions, websites, um, <laughs> yeah. um, newspapers, magazines. And in terms of them opening up, how do you get them to, to trust you and talk to you? And Oh, yeah. The hardest part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very... Uh... <laughs> Uh, it's very challenging because uh, sometimes uh, I need to approach them like uh, two months or three months because uh, they don't trust easily. Uh, they don't trust easily, especially they know that uh, I'm a photojournalist or uh, because um, at some moment, it's very important for me to, to be upfront that I'm for the journalist and then uh, I'm very uh, interesting to hear your story. And then this is also part of my personal project uh, with the possibilities. To, I mean, it's very important to tell them that uh, with the possibilities that uh, I might publish uh, the story, I might publish your story. Because um, by telling them upfront that you're, you're a photojournalist, uh, you're not lie to them. Uh, it's very easier for them uh, to be, I mean, at some point, I mean, there's pros and cons. Sometimes they're afraid to tell, uh, to tell honestly what happened, what happened to them, or sometimes they're afraid that you're part of the government, you're part of the embassy, or you, you just want to, uh, just want to get story published and then that's it. And then uh, I, I'm, you get the story, uh, you get the story or sometimes when you publish your story I didn't get anything I'm still working as a I'm still working as a migrant workers I'm still uh, I'm still poor I'm still the way I am so um, I mean like um, I mean like being honest is very important so and then just stay true to yourself uh, and just keep back and forth because they will know that oh that's She's very serious, and she's very, um, she's very serious that um, not you not uh, she's not only coming that get the story and that they see it, publish it, and then they see it, you're leaving just like not like just like another uh, reporter or like another journalist when they know that you keep coming back and then uh, sometimes you're not 
pull out your camera and then that's it. Uh, when you become when you become friends and then uh, you also tell about your story, your family, and I don't know, I think it's just, it happens automatic, auto, automatically. I think it takes time, it takes time, but it's worth, I think. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. I said, good, thank you. <laughs> so I think we will go. So are you going to have electricity in half an hour or not? <laughs> And it's uh, almost 2 a.m. here. Actually, they will turn off uh, the electricity at 2 a.m. And okay. they will start to, to uh, I mean, you get usually like you have like five hours to get the water and then they will uh, stop the water. So, yeah, I mean, that's Okay, it. <laughs> because I would like yeah, that. No I would like that Alice do her presentation. I still have like 45 minutes. Okay, so and then at the end, just so that you can discuss a little bit. <laughs> So yeah. I, I appreciate it. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and everybody else, as I said, I gave you Oki's Instagram. Is it okay if people reach out to ask you if they have more questions or yeah, email you sure. or something? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I need to. Um... Hi, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, wow. Okay, let's get the presentation it is here um okay um today i'm going to present a um body of work i've been developing between 2017 and 2018 um this is a visual visual research about migrant women who arrived in sicily uh, due to the migratory flow, um, this, um, well, the point is that since the um, migration uh, has been documented um, mainly, largely um, from the male point of view, um, the female reality has been told very marginally and, uh, and rarely by the direct inter uh, interest parties. So um, I would start with methodology. Um, I use the CBPR methodology, which means uh, community-based participatory research. Um, this method uh, allowed me to uh, leave women protagonists of the stories, um, uh, stories of, of this uh, because this is a huge phenomenon that takes, um, it, it has different shades depending on, um, on the country. And uh, here I had to, you know, choose my, uh, my tools very carefully. So um, the, um, this method allowed me to be free uh, to um, allow the women to this project to the discourse as they feel right. Uh, because this is not a, an interview. Uh, this, um, this is more about dialogue. Um, there is another important thing about the methodology to say, which is um, that basically to uh, protect the most vulnerable, uh, I, um, I, I recorded um, audios, but um, I beeped their name and I altered their voice uh, because it was important to me to share their um, their actual uh, saying. So um, this is to um, answer to it. I think she was Montserrat asking how to get um, women. Uh, open and tell your story? Well, uh, this is uh, a very good question because um, this specific project I'm presenting today, uh, it is about speaking with them, not about them. So the, um, the migration uh, is, uh, is a direct consequence of capitalism exploitation of people and territories. And um, it, it is, as I said, it is all over the world. It is uh, a share 
feature uh, of many countries that um, I, I think this is the price um, we have to pay, they have to pay, unfortunately, um, to let us live in the lucky side of the world. Allow me this uh, way to say. So what happened that um, before the Second World War, the historical and political context has been uh, largely discussed and, cri and critically analyzed uh, and also rejected by the European avant-garde who actually condemned and uh, proposed new models. Here we, we can see the, um, uh, the con this is the Guernica, uh, a painting by Pablo Picasso that is a good example to see how art can analyze um, a certain, uh, a certain uh, historical period and, uh, and condemn it. Um, but also like Dad, uh, Dadaists, they, they also propose new models. Being an artist, you know, is not uh, an individualistic choice. So um, in my view, the role of, uh, of art in general is to not to produce a representation of something, just to copy reality. It is more about in investigation, about um, investigate social, political, and economical forces, process them both aesthetically and ethically, and repropose it like a, a sort of, it is a sort of digestion. So since ever, art has been um, functional um, to, mm, to the human being and uh, to tell the history of human being. In fact, art has been used uh, to hand down knowledge since the dawn of the time, or it has been used to describe fashion of the time, uh, to tell us about historical facts. Here we can see uh, the issues battle, um, or even to tell stories, um, to affirm power or to state against it. Well, you know, um, there are a lot of ways to describe times and people and art is um, a very um, impactful way to do so. Also because it allows us to depict reality, to also exercise trauma. So to turn history in collective memory, um, sorry, uh, I was saying, um, here we can see how we can turn history into collective memory. Photography is, uh, has been very important to, to this process. Um, going a bit forward, because I understand there is not much time left. I, um, observe, I want you now to observe these two different pictures. One second, are you showing us a presentation? Yeah. We don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, trying to write to you on all the channels because I didn't want to interrupt your passionate speech. But... Oh dear, okay, because I, I'm, I'm actually sharing the screen. I'll try again, sorry. No problem, no problem. Sorry, I waited so long, but <laughs> because nothing, it didn't even go black or anything. So we just like, okay, she started, it's good. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't matter, I'll share again. It was actually sharing. I don't know what happened. Okay, fair enough. Can you see it now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. All good. Okay. So I was saying, let's start maybe from here because it, I don't want to go back from the beginning, if it's okay with you all. I suppose, but these are your. This is your your project. This is, uh, this, this is part of uh, the research. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, well, I guess we should start, yeah, from here and keep going. Okay. I'd really love to see the photos you have in the presentation. Okay, 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 okay. But it, it is quite, it is quite straightforward. So I will uh, show you again uh, the pictures. Yes. So, uh, 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 okay. Uh, I was saying that uh, art has a role to play in, uh, in all this situation. 
um, mainly because it has been, as I said, used to um, handle many aspects of human life. So I want to do one thing first. Okay. So uh, I said uh, artists used to hand down knowledge, as you can see here from uh, mural paintings, uh, to describe, as I said, the fashion of the time, um, to tell us about historical facts or stories, to affirm power, or even to state against it. So um, I was saying that um, it also helps to describe people in times. And here we can see a very good um, recent, uh, one of the probably the, the most recent uh, um, piece of work by Andy Worrell. It is one of his um, last uh, work, uh, works. Um, but it's also useful to depict trauma, to depict re uh, reality, to exercise traumas. Here we, we can see uh, Rome uh, Open City, uh, which talks about um, the Nazi uh, invasion of Rome. So it is also uh, useful to turn history into collective memory, as we can see. So visual product, uh, production works uh, between uh, mechanisms and structures of society and also social actors. So as we can understand, uh, art practice uh, hardly can be aseptic. Uh, I would ask you to have a look at these two pictures. Um, one, the first one, uh, is uh, related to um, the, uh, the war in Spain uh, under Franco. There was a, a inter internal uh, war um, from, the, from the population against the, um, the state. And of course, as every war, we can see picture of women fleeing. Um, we can see here, observing those two pictures, that we can read a gender-based narration. Um, I would like to propose a Caroline Brothers uh, observation that, that uh, states how power of images derives from the contrast of the humans with the hardness of uh, the mountain in the street. Also, the, the, there is uh, the, um, the sight of the children, uh, the, the, the look of the children that are di directly uh, pointed to the retrospection of the lens. So this is suggesting not only probably uh, the um, endlessness of the journey, uh, but also their mother responsibility toward them. Um, this is also underlined by the fact that she holds the, uh, the youngest uh, of her children in, uh, in her arms. In the second image, we can see the same principle applied decades, decades later in, um, in the Syrian war context. Um, we can notice how the, uh, in addition of uh, the hardness of the picture itself, uh, we can also perceive um, insecurity, probably mm, because of uh, the context of the refugee camp. And this theme, as, uh, as it has been also pointed out by Alisa and Alicia already, but this theme relegates women in the most passive role, which is the assumption that the only role a woman uh, refugee or um, Sorry, I can't remember words sometimes. <laughs> um, um, I was saying, so the assumption that uh, the only role uh, a refugee woman, a migrant woman ca uh, can have is to be a mother. And like in this case, or as already we established before, um, at the, just at the mercy of the events. 
most of the women I met, uh, they took their time before deciding if they wanted to share their experience with me and how. Some of them decide to hide their identity. Other actually enjoy a smiling picture and uh, other just, just, just didn't want to show off and expose themselves. I consider that the victim oppressor relationship becomes, uh, becomes as such when it generates a mechanism according which um, the victim refuses the, her role and try to self-determine her life by saying no. Because don't forget, um, there is a relation of power between uh, the, uh, the first war, world and uh, the rest of the world, because we are, we are living in a classist and uh, capitalistic um, dimension system. That's the word. <laughs> So um, we actually um, discuss this um, this topic um, with uh, with a Middle Eastern woman uh, during our group talks. This principle also matches with the uh, with the play of forces between migrants and civilized this word. I was uh, as I was saying. This is um, this is why I. Um, Purchase an Instax Mini uh, to use along my um, classic Canon camera because I realized that um, basically I, I, it is probably because in how first world, in the civilized world, um, with all the practice we have, didn't not last the technocratic perception of something becoming real by uh, being turned in something shareable, uh, like a video, an audio, or I don't know, a photo. So uh, instead of um, pr producing something shareable, I decide to use this Instax Mini because uh, first of all, to give something back to them. Um, and second, I think that having a printed photo or, uh, and being able to shake it actually in your hands can be uh, quite comforting sometimes. So um, I would like you to have another look, uh, a good look uh, to uh, this photo, these photos. This is um, a passenger by Cesar Descoli. And uh, this has been very significant um, uh, as a reference for my work because uh, this is a multi-prize, um, uh, this is a multi-prize uh, prize, uh, and recognized series. Um, well, what is important is that that's fully tries to give a name and a face to the numbers um, of the migration. But in this series of portraits, he documents faces, ages, origins of 180 men uh, and boys rescued by the uh, Juventus ship. This series, however, doesn't respond to the question that Caesar Detsfully himself poses, who is behind these numbers? We still know nothing about them, their life, their experiences. We can only imagine by looking at them uh, and yet, we know there is, uh, it, this is always uh, about men. This is not uh, including any, uh, anybody else, but men aged between 11 and 31. So my research intended to uh, make a step forward, to look behind names and ages, also because many people lie about their actual age to get included in the lucky list for the refugee status. So um, I, I felt like it, it is useless just to you know, have another list. We, we already have thousands of lists. So um, to, do, uh, to do so, um, to do so, I synthesize uh, this experience uh, as a, uh, I was a, a kind of temporary element in that community. 
uh, temporary individual. Uh, so um, I had to build up relationships and to do so, oops, yeah, well, <laughs> I had to um, spend time with them. Um, also, another thing that is important, I didn't uh, follow uh, only one uh, refugee center. Um, I, uh, I spent time in three different cities crossing the, the whole island and basically um, following the, uh, the, the path the, uh, the refugee um, are pushing, uh, are, are, oh God. Okay, um, basically, sorry. <laughs> Basically, this is um, this is the path uh, they follow. Um, they arrived in Sicily, crossing the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, they arrived in the south part of the island. And then they are um, split in different groups uh, in different uh, shelters, etc. So I actually follow the main uh, the main areas. To, to meet the, the, the woman uh, for this project. Um, so um, with those pictures, I, want to, um, I wanted to underline that despite the experience, the migrant women are not passive. Um, they, um, they, uh, it, it is all about how we um, perceive them. So, um, in this, uh, in these two pictures, uh, I, I can show very well how um, the perception of this woman uh, in this case uh, can be different depending on the on, on the shot. So uh, the first one, uh, I I just uh, did the experiment, uh, ask, just asking her, um, can we uh, have a, a quick picture right now? But then I took another picture when she started playing with uh, her son. So we can see um, we can see here that it is um, evident how the way we represent women um, shape our perception. So um, yeah. One of the most important lessons I have learned during my uh, artistic studies concerned, um, concerned the concept of emptiness, void. When I'm drawing, I instinctively reproduce the shape, I outline the contour. But is, um, by instinct, I'm focusing on the edges, bringing into focus the object while analyzing the object itself uh, in relation to the emptiness around it. But we can do also the opposite. If I individuate uh, all the empty space and excluding the subject, the shape of the object will be revealed anyway. So documenting the spaces without having physically a person um, there in, in this, into the space, into the picture, allow us to observe the traces the person is leaving behind. Um, also to give back a narrative that may reconsider the idea of the migrant women leading the idea of women Madonna with no alternative. It, it was um, one of my priorities. So I think that to limit migration storytelling to a modern exodus is a way to talk about something, talk about the argument without actually taking a position about this cause. This is why I did not focus only in one single story. Um, show people as one thing over and over again. And um, it, it, this is what they become. Too often, they are also they also become somehow a representative of a um, whole country or population. So this uh, gener generate stereotypes with its one to uh, what I wanted to uh, to fight with my work. In fact, a single story um, 
you know, it, it kind of robbed people of their dignity in a way, and it emphasized differences instead of similarities. So it is kind of, yeah, they, they, are, they are people from somewhere else, but we don't perceive them as real, made of flesh and bones. It is something else depending on uh, the, the, the picture we are uh, looking at. So this kind of storytelling from my point of view uh, is, is an act to rehumanization, like to kind of repairing broken dignity from, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from uh, a photographer point of view. So I, I feel like we have the responsibility to think about certain um, certain things when, when we um, plan a project. So uh, I wanted to show this picture specifically. This is, this is a very, uh, this is very dear to me because um, it talks about trust and um, the story behind is that um, this woman, uh, after we uh, started chatting about her, uh, about her, about me, about the structure and uh, different, different topics, uh, she, she trusted me and she, she just opened herself to asking me, can you, take me to the sea, I lost my baby there. I, I, and then she started talking about the experience of seeing your baby drawing and she couldn't do nothing. She was actually powerless and she, this destroyed her inside. This, this is what uh, crossing the Mediterranean Sea is. But we can't see this from, um, of course, the newspaper. Um, as we can see from uh, the story of, uh, I have gathered, migrant women are enveloped in a system of relationship based on gender. In term, uh, also in terms of experience before, during the trip, and eventually the reception, and also within the macro structure, that um, the labor system proposed. So refugees and migrants in Europe are banned from employment from, uh, for, for a significant, le significant length of time. So uh, this is probably to, don't, um, to not, not to compete with, with the citizens because I, I can't see any other reason. For many women, in fact, making bread, making bread uh, is a good chance to make some money because many Western women like to wear African hairstyle. Too many, too many women fall black into slavery, human trafficking, local prostitution. And for local pro prostitution, I mean, when they arrive into the structure that should uh, welcome them, they are actually exposed to um, mafia, for example, and um, other um, and other local um, mechanisms that doesn't allow them to just break the chain. So, um, oh, and another thing, impo another important thing to say is that. Um, very, uh, most of them are taken from their places where, where um, physically or um, where, um, with lies. There, there is a story of this woman, uh, or this little girl actually, because she was uh, 17 when I met her, uh, that uh, she, uh, she, um, she, uh, was actually having a hard time in their village, and uh, someone just uh, went to the, uh, went to her, saying, "If you want to make your life better, if you want to be someone in your life, if you want to help out your family, just come with me in Europe. You will have a better life." She ended up in Libya, raped, and. Um, all alone, almost dead, and uh, another woman from um, from Libya took her in her house and uh, 
give her the time to to heal. Uh, she she arrived in Sicily in very horrible conditions. Um, yeah, well, uh, the walkers. This is the last part of my presentation. The, the Walkers is a series from this body of work that is very dear to me. Mm, as I was not going to depict these women as a humanitarian emergency. I had to experiment a, with a way to portray them, um, portray their, their pathos, their, their, their feelings, their, their, their experience, um, while hiding most of their faces, and I instinctively went for the feet. This is, this is why, um, this is because um, it is a pretty symbolic image to me. Uh, it, it, they crossed the entire countries, the desert and the sea, walking. So um, I think this can be a, a very uh, good way to portray uh, someone without um, expose their identities, uh, because also we, we don't know what they um, left behind. So it is, um, it, it is not a good idea just to put, her, put them fa their face everywhere. Uh, each of them had a chance to um, to choose, as I said at the beginning, how to expose themselves. So, for example, if you, if we can see here, uh, the the first image is with the is showing her face. The second one is not. So this is all about free will, and I was a kind, just a kind of tool in their hand. So uh, yeah. This this is my uh, this is my work. This is my kind of experimental narrative um, body of work, and uh, it has been completely uh, entirely self-funded. Unfortunately, because I didn't find any <laughs> uh, anyone willing to invest in this kind of research. But hey, uh, I did it. I'm happy to share it with you today. And uh, I'm very curious to say, to, to see uh, what you what you think about that. So yeah, I can't. How did I? Uh -huh. You want me to stop the screen share? I can yeah, do that but too. I can't find this is down. Oh yeah, here. Stop. Okay, I think I just stopped. Is that right? No. Yeah, the presentation yeah, okay. is gone. Does so, anybody have any direct questions? Uh, Maria, you messaged me instead of the group. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> um, So, I mean, I, I have a question. What were you hoping uh, to achieve with documenting this process? Considering that, you know, that part of the world is, was, uh, there was a time that was quite heavily documented. Absolutely everybody. I mean, I know people who traveled from Ireland to uh, Southern Italy to document. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. I was there, uh, I just, that's this topic because I, I born in Sicily, and this was a way uh, to see my own territory. Um, but if we talk, if we think about how many people from the um, uh, from Europe just came down to Sicily to document, not to document, but to find the the right shot. This happened as well in Calais when there was this humanitarian desperate situation, lots of people just grabbed a ticket and went there. They, they didn't, many of them didn't have any, any 
uh, intention to document, but just to um, say, you know, have got a good shot here. Mm -hmm. This is an ethic. And um, what I uh, hope to, um, to res resolve in a way with this research is the, um, well, I want to go against racist and um, opportunistic um, narration. Uh, this was intended to be translated, at, uh, at is, uh, it is, uh, translated in Italian because it was actually a reaction of what I heard, what I, what I read, because it is not acceptable that um, the, the, the left um, the left parties, the left, the left movement around the world. I don't know if if you may, you may know this. In Varsavia, 2017, there was the international of the, the fascists from all over the the European um, continent. Now in uh, in Poland, we have a desperate left obscurantistic uh, situation. So I was actually worried about the fascist narration uh, that was circulating uh, at, at the time, but it's still circulating right now. Mm -hmm. that, that's in, okay. in synthesizing, mm -hmm. this is the, the So while we still have Oki for like a couple of minutes, I guess, uh, we still have you or you? 10 minutes, so we have 10 minutes with Oki. So, Could I, 10 minutes before the shut off the light. Yeah, 10 minutes before the shut off the electricity. Cool, so I would really love that you just take a few minutes to discuss. Sure. So as we were talking in the first block about the importance of you know communal storytelling, of coming from, from the community. So we'll give the, the, the time to Oki for a minute, for a few minutes, just, um, you know, so, First of all, I, I guess the question is, is why did you become a documentary photographer and, you know, why are you not documenting your own stories rather somebody else's stories? What's the importance? What's the value? I think like, uh, yeah, we are, we are very often, we, uh, we often hear like the best story uh, is come from, from your own backyard. But what happens uh, if our own backyards are related with a lot of issues? I mean, like, um, of course, uh, everything is everything's political. <laughs> Every person is political anyway. But um, I think um, probably because uh, as a woman, I see uh, there's a lot of issue about them, which is very important to share. Uh, it's not only to the world, but only. Uh, to the community because um, the best we can do, the best we can do, I mean like photography is just a photography, photo is just a photo, it's just like an object, just like a, in the paper or just hang out uh, like a paintings, but it's, it's more important if uh, your works um, mean something the others. But uh, in my case, probably because I started working, I mean like I started working as a journalist, so, uh, I'm very uh, interested uh, how to get connected with people and then uh, and you cannot change the world but we can change uh, we can change we can change our little world uh, by doing something but I think like our story our personal story is also important I mean like um, as a photographer sometimes nowadays as you know there's a lot of personal story about uh, their family or, or their own mother or their own sister or father uh, i mean it's also important but for me i feel like um i feel like uh, I, I'm, I'm i'm i feel like um as a human uh, i feel like i'm very you can use me you can use me as a, with my profession uh to do to, to voice who cannot, who cannot, who, who voiceless, I think, I think that's the point, I think. Um, just to, to answer your question, to share uh, those who cannot, uh, those who cannot um, voice their own opinion or their voice, I think, sounds, sounds typical, but it's true mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay, so should we let you go or? 
<laughs> you have five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. But, but I do have to question to Alice. I mean, I'm very interested. I mean, it's amazing work. But uh, the story, your story about a woman from Libya. I mean, it also happened. Is it also happened in? Uh, I mean, like there's a woman to put in the situation, like a woman from Libya. There's a man approach her, and then I can offer you a lot of money. It's also happened um, in in my country, like. It's very easy to offering like a high wage or high salary or is it is it is it uh, is it always classic modus operandi uh, uh, like for human trafficking how to put a woman in in a trap by uh, approaching like a woman with their uh, with their condition or they come from a, a poor village or probably uh, a country with a conflict so is it also the same because what you said with the woman in Libya also ha also happened uh, in a woman in other countries not only uh, uh, probably not only in Libya but also in Indonesia or you, if you if you met a victim of human trafficking or if you met uh, under undocumented migrant workers who are being abused or being raped usually they come from a uh, a very remote area, or they come in the, not in a, like in, in a poor village. Is it always the same? I mean, like, is it? Is it also no. happen for women? Aside I of think, their, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I I couldn't uh, hear very well. Uh, the the last part. Can you say again? Yeah, I mean, like, is it also? I mean, is it always uh, happen um, for a woman like? just offering a lot of money, high wage, and then it's, uh, I don't know, it's part of your research. Is it a poverty also trigger to put women in a trap or to put, uh, or how women become a victim? Is it, I don't know, is it uh, well, part of their research mm -hmm. as well? Because it's not also happened in Europe or in Libya. It also happened in every country. Exactly. This is uh, why at the beginning I said that in different shades, women from all over the world face the same difficulties. Because, um, you know, um, in general, we are not actually perceived as what we are. I mean, feminist is this uh, crazy idea that wants to consider a woman as a human being with rights, right? So um, this crazy idea of feminism uh, springs because unfortunately there is no country in the world that is not uh, under patriarchy. So um, with different conditions, the same pattern is always uh, repeated. So, for example, if uh, if I'm uh, in um, in Central Africa and someone approaches me, uh, saying, uh, you know, um, I want to give you a chance to go in Europe and elevate yourself, study, earn money, etc. Why is that? Because the, this woman doesn't have this. At the same time she wants to uh, try to elevate herself. The point is that all um, women in, even in, uh, in, in Italy, okay, for example, in, in the UK, okay, the, um, the heart of capitalism and, and the first world, etc. Here, uh, women still fight for basic, uh, basic rights like uh, equal wage or um, representation in uh, how to represent their uh, our story, history, um, and you know. I truly believe that with. Um, with the uh, depending on the country, the the same phenomenon uh, is uh, perceived more or less heavy, but it is all all, all the same, because a woman can be um, can be tricked and raped everywhere, 
because we have all the same um, weaknesses. We are perceived as weak everywhere. All right, so to, to reply to your question, yes, I think this is very common also because there are criminal organizations um, that start with the idea to go in, uh, um, in Africa to get women to feed the prostitution um, market. It, it is a very complex system that embrace the planet. We, we shouldn't think, in my opinion, uh, that um, it is a unique situation for each country. That this, this is why I truly believe in trans international feminism, because we have the chance to uh, compare our experiences and see what is a common line for a common fight. Oh, thank did you, I, Abby. Did I reply yeah. you? So certainly is. It's very interesting, and it's also uh, it's at some way you mentioned about system, it's also complicated actually. And also um, some policy maker, um, some policy maker are usually uh, still dominated by a male domination. And then I don't know. I mean, uh, in my country, uh, most of the ministry who who organize or who who are uh, man, they are responsible for uh, 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 for the uh, migrant workers as well. Um, most of them are are male, so it is quite funny because uh, in a male domination, uh, but uh, the victim is still mostly about the women. So uh, part of the policy maker are still uh, are still dominated by a male domination. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, sorry, I just wanted to say that. I, Aki, if you're still with us, I wanted to invite um, Alicia and Alisa um, because I wanted just a brief conversation between the four of you, but now I'm getting that um, Alisa is sick. And so you still have some energy to chat with us. We can't hear you. your microphone is mu muted. Uh. Yes, yes, I can stay a little bit more. I'm really yeah. sorry. I'm feeling, <laughs> feeling very sick. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm really, really happy to be here and to listen to, to all of you because it's really inspiring and I relate uh, with a lot of things that were said. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone for sharing your work and your thoughts. And uh, I really related to something that was said before about giving back dignity to to, to people, to women uh, in particular. I think as artists and as feminists, that's something that we want to do. And also as human being, you know, because the word rehumanizing, I think was really right uh, because there is all this process of dehumanization of migrants and of women, which is a very powerful tool to justify the violence. Um, if a group of people is depicted as less than human because uh, they don't have the same needs. Uh, uh, pre um, uh, we pretend that they don't have the same needs, the same feelings, uh, the same behaviors, and so on. And that serves as the basis of uh, the violence. So I think this idea of giving back the voices to the people that are not heard, never heard, or never seen. I, I think that's the most powerful thing that can be done. Uh, I don't know if Alicia is still with us as well. Yes, yes, I'm still there. <laughs> and I agree with you. And uh, first of all, I, I wanted to thank you uh, for this amazing work uh, because I was really touched uh, by uh, all you said and, and, and the, the photos. And uh, I think we really need professionals, photographers to tell stories in the name of people who are too busy to, to try to survive or try to live in dignity, to have the opportunities to tell their own stories themselves. So thanks again for telling these stories. 
Um, I especially like the, the process when you say talking with and not just about people. And I like also the, um, the image that uh, you use when you talk about the process of dig digestion. Uh, and I think it's also what something the professional photographer brings. It's, it's like they have this uh, outside point of view, but also this um, uh, feelings that they, they, they catch from uh, from themselves, and they have this possibility to do this digestion. It, I mean, in in the way that I understood it, and sometimes when we are just uh, facing the realities and telling our own realities, we don't have this opportunity to to have this uh, step behind and to take forward and to have a look on our own um, uh, realities. And 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 the the professional photographers bring this and and I like yes, I like the metaphor of digest and I think it makes sense for me um, and I also like uh, your work because it was indeed an act of rehumanization and repairing breaking dignity and we can feel it and hold um, the, 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 the process to exercise trauma and to to have a social impact. You, you, you say uh, that you cannot uh, change the world, but uh, still, I think we can have some uh, mental impact, and that is worth it. Uh, but, you know, feminists are very optimist, so <laughs> that's also why I, I say that. Um, and I also uh, like when you, you mentioned how important is it to, uh, to like, Professional photographers are, are, are bringing something new comparing to the mainstream media and to the pictures that we saw in the mainstream media, especially on uh, migrant women and refugees. You say that uh, we are used to know numbers, but who are behind the numbers? Who are these people? And uh, also when we say when we, we saw uh, migrant women or, or refugees women, there are mostly uh, being seen as mothers, you mentioned that even NGOs campaigns are, are, are showing kind of the same cliche and, and spreading this kind of cliche. And I like the way how, um, like you did, uh, you are trying to uh, show more than this cliche, to show more than just uh, a, a support charity campaign or media articles, mainstream media are doing so. We definitely need you. We definitely uh, need um, um, professional uh, Is everybody as much as we need also for uh, selling uh, sell their yes, sorry, it's my kids. <laughs> then I will <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> okay, I, I had a question, by the way, I'm, I'm afraid we lost Alicia for a minute, but you, you give workshops. Do you work with other photographers or people who want to be photographers or is it kind of a little bit like what Femlands does to teach community or... And I mostly, yeah. A little bit, a little bit different. Uh, like uh, Femlands, you have like a photography workshops uh, for refugees. But uh, in my case, most of the migrant workers uh, they have a very limited access uh, for uh, cell phone because mostly they are working as a domestic workers, and also uh, uh, they that they don't even have a camera. So uh, so far, when I had a workshop, mostly. Uh, my workshop is uh, attend to um, uh, local NGO, local NGO who works uh, focusing on the human rights issue or human trafficking or sometimes working with the community on the grassroots. Uh, so because it's part of the, I mean, like, like in, in East Nusa Tenggara, I'm working or in West Java, um, I'm not only showing a uh, uh, presenting my story, but also uh, working along with them how to make a, a photo story that you can uh, you can create your own story from your own perspective, and they uh, 
they've been working like more than like they know better than me they are working a lot with the migrant workers as well so i think like the best way is uh, to like uh, to share um, a little bit um, about my knowledge about for the story about how to do a research how to find a different approach in uh, visual storytelling and uh, as uh, Alice, Alicia, Alicia shared that um, not only showing like a um, uh, photo on the media or mainstream, but uh, you can, because they know better than me, they um, dealing a lot with the micro workers, with the victims, so uh, they can produce a better story than me. Um, so far, I'm working along with the local NGO, um, compare what you did with the workshop, okay. actually. Uh -huh. That's actually a really would... good good point about the the collaboration between different actors, no, and the different stakeholders. That was such a popular word, no, because you could be working with law enforcement and a local NGO and the local migrants and yourself, and sometimes you are the most neutral and you are able to connect the various players somehow because uh, everybody just wants to give you information because that's your role. And so, you know, I'm very much for the community of voices, but if we're talking about the absolute value of a journalist, um, maybe this is a slightly more, more new way of doing also journalism is True. that we're, yeah, maybe less agenda and more engagement or something, but sometimes we can be in those positions where we can connect lots of other players through ourselves. It's very interesting. True, very true indeed. So we oh, have, uh, and also the last time, I mean, like, uh, last time I had a workshop um, uh, for the government, for the for the government. So part uh, one of the participants are uh, the staff who work in the prison. So after they know about the photo story or visual storytelling, uh, we don't have. I mean, like compared to those who are working in the prison, of course, they have a lot of access and they know uh, the story better uh, compared to us. We need a lot of access. We need to permission and uh, just sharing about the importance of visual storytelling or the power of uh, visual storytelling or the power of photography. I mean, just by giving a uh, skill or a little bit or uh, like what we know about uh, the power of visual story uh, itself. I mean, like, uh, sometimes um, they they produce a great story because they work there. They know uh, the better condition. They met a lot of people. So I think like um, yeah. I mean just like um, I mean uh, yeah. I mean that's the point. I mean like uh, you share what you know and then uh, let them let them uh, let them let them let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Wow. Um, I would ask something about collaboration. Do you know if there is any program or uh, agreement or any thought uh, about uh, this kind of topic? I mean, uh, if, if we find a way to, um, to, to exchange between countries like uh, as the um, Erasmus does, but with these topics should should be great. So I think uh, if there is known, we should there is, like- There is, so Aki and I, we met through um, an anti-human trafficking lab, which is then later was created into a, a really large network of um, journalists, uh, politicians, activists, um, workers in like OSCE or, you know, different human rights organizations, international and smaller ones. And uh, we have various platforms where we are all connected and uh, share stories and, you know, reach out. You can always reach out to people and ask them if you're in their country or if you need information or there's like, yeah, it's, it's a really fantastic was, network. Yeah, what I was more thinking about um, like funded programs to allow women to know each other or something like this, but in a, in a photographic and visual way. This is, I'm asking this because uh, as I was uh, saying before, it, it would be great if, um, if there was a, 
uh, constant attention uh, to this topic, uh, not just um, different, um, like today the, the, there is this festival, then there is this organization that does this, I don't know, um, woman day with uh, pictures, etc. cetera. I, I, I was thinking about something more consistent and unite. So this is... This yeah, I think I think I told you that there is also this AWID, it's avid.org, um, and it's a woman's network, which is, there's everything there, there's like media and, but also like NGO workers and... I remember this, but I didn't understand if this is a funded um, program or how it works. I, well, I, I should... They I'm have, working. yeah, they have a forum, they have a directory, you can reach out to people, they organize once a year, um, this year obviously was postponed, they have a kind of a summit, uh, different countries in different years, and uh, in that summit, they call it a feminist perspective, so for example, we applied with a project on representing the, the migrant experience through the eyes of migrant women, the exhibition of our students, so there's various layers or various organizations i guess it's up to all of i mean you have to think regionally no for example for for southeast asia in the context of southeast asia we can participate in single events to meet each other and make that connection like when aki and i met we were in kenya both coming from completely different parts of the world but on a day-to-day -day basis it's not like we could be doing similar work there but now that we are connected through these various organizations, we can always keep in track and you know, ask questions or initiate a project together that could be cross-border. That could also be interesting. So my understanding in the way that these kind of bigger projects work is that they meet people, they introduce people in various ways, but then it's up to us to continue the, mm -hmm, course, the relationship, to continue the projects, to continue doing... Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, personally, so since I've met Aki, I haven't, I haven't directly worked on human trafficking since then, or anti-human trafficking, but Aki and I communicate quite a lot because I feel like there's still so much that crosses over in terms of our work and the importance of the work. So um, yeah, that, that would be, I mean, there's definitely networks of different kinds where women can meet each other, including like physically coming together once a year from all over the world until obviously the pandemic happened. So check out this avid um, awid.org. I will double check them. Yeah. Um, does, it, does anybody in the, in the audience who's left standing, thank you for standing or sitting. Uh, if you have some questions to Aki, maybe if not, we could let her go because it's 3 a.m. now <laughs> or something or 2 a.m. <laughs> um, or Aki, if you want to say something, 2.25, that's, yeah, early enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, I think we, we can say we, we did it for today. Yeah, I feel like if there is no more questions, I, I think it's uh, for first day, I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit. <laughs> 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 well, for the first day, it was quite good, I have to say. Definitely. Participated. Okay, yeah, so everybody, everybody wants to go. Okay. Yeah, we're going to let everybody go. Aki, again, thank you so much. Alicia, thank you so much. We're really happy to have you. And everybody else, thank I you. hope we see you tomorrow in the, in the first session for the workshop. And then the second session, the workshop is going to be very, very interesting as well. So um, I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Oki. Thanks, everybody, like for this amazing work. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, Thank you, Alicia. No, don't go. Wait, wait, wait. OK, don't uh, go. Wait. OK, wait, wait, wait. Are you OK? Are you OK with me uh, emailing you? Uh, I've got your contact. Sure. So is, is that fine yes, for you? Definitely. I think we have a lot of point, uh, common points. Exactly, that's why. <laughs> Yes. Right. I will be very this happy. Is, Ellie, this is the way the way how uh
get it, I get connected. I mean, uh, we keep corresponding, we keep updating. So yeah. <laughs> look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Take care Goodbye. of you and thanks again. Bye bye. Bye, girls. Ciao, everybody. Bye. bye. Good night. <laughs> bye. So...